All right, everybody's coming on in. We'll give everybody a few minutes to come on in the room and we'll get started. All right, so we'll go ahead and um, get started. Um, John Ellis is our keynote speaker for our 2021 virtual spring symposium. And uh, we are so glad to hear, have John here. You may know John from Ford Company, Ford Motor Company, um, but John is here with us now as a futurist and I won't do any more introductions. John is gonna introduce himself throughout his presentation. So John, we are looking forward to it and here we go. Thanks very much, Felina. Uh, welcome one and all. Um, hopefully now let's make sure that we get this all started. See what we got. We'll make sure double check in that you can see. You can either Ray, you can put a thumb up or Glenn, thumb up looks good. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Welcome to uh, to your 2021 uh, spring meeting. Um, as Selena said, my name is John Ellis, and I'm going to be sharing today a little bit of difference to to what you would normally get in a in a conference like this. This is going to be a little bit more forward looking, and we're going to be looking at through the lens of transportation, and 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 looking at the innovations that come from right around the corner. And so to do that, I want to first introduce myself, but I want to introduce myself in a way that delivers to you the biases that I bring to this conversation. Uh, a couple different notes that uh, I, I will lay out here. Number one, this session is being recorded, so it will be available to you afterwards as you're thinking through questions and, and whatnot. Number two, we would encourage all questions, dump them into, into the chat. Felina is going to be uh, talking to me afterwards, and we're going to be going through them. If questions aren't answered in the chat, I'll take a, a note of them, and we'll get you uh, questions by email. And last but not least, all the slides that you see here uh, will be delivered to you after the session uh, in a PDF format. But more importantly, what will also accompany it is something that I call the information cited document. So it's a document that contains all of my notes, um, my speak to points, where my analysis comes from, so that you can take a look at that with a, an independent eye and come to your own conclusions and ideas of where, where things might be. So with that in mind, uh, who, who is John and, and what am I doing here? Uh, as Selena said, I, I'm coming to you as, as a futurist. And, and what that really means is I have a lot of history behind me. And so I'm going to share a little bit about that, but you know, through a lens. Uh, I started my career actually uh, in software as a software developer at, at a company called Motorola, which you may remember well, well and dear. Um, while there, I actually started a, a company called Ellison Associates to kind of do consulting and some teaching. I was able to teach at a, at a college and a university period for a period of time. Um, and I sold that company. And now I have another company that you know is JT Consulting that I that I do, but what brings me to you on this stage here today is a couple different things in terms of key software through through my my lens at Motorola, um, and that is all related to open source. The idea of being able to build and deliver open source. You are all IT. You understand what open source is, but these are some of the projects that were near and dear to my heart that I still participate in and deliver in. And key to that, the two key things at Motorola was the ability to bring open source into a corporate environment in the in the early 2000s. So for those of you remembering your time, this was this was sort of anathema in that in that arena. Um, but number one, number one, number one was the idea of of an operating system. For so very long, we had been buying operating systems and putting them on our phones, uh, and a few of us began to ask the question why. And so uh, a group of us put together the very first ever Linux package for cell phones. Uh, Motorola delivered the very first Linux-based cell phone ever in the world. Uh, today. You now are inundated with Android and with um, my, uh, Apple, which is a, a form of a Linux or a Unix type. Um, but that was back then in early 2000 was at first in the world. It was interesting and it was wonderful. And it was unique. But building on top of that, a group of us began to say, well, why do we have to know everything that our customers are doing? And this was this back when a phone was a phone and everything else was something else. And today everything has been converged into one. And so we built the very first ever ecosystem uh, for the mobile devices. And um, we were allowing for third parties to build, deliver, and put value on top of our products. Um, again, very, very uh, crushing and different to the corporate America world. Uh, but it was something that ultimately has been proven out. And today you know that as the app store and whatnot. But Motorola was the very first to be able to do an over-the-air update, an over-the-air download, an over-the-air secure uh, image movement from one place to a device. 
after 20, a little bit over 20 years, left Motorola and uh, went to Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company found me as a consultant, uh, and they actually asked me to write them a software strategy paper for the connected car. Uh, once they read it, they liked what they saw, so then they hired me as a global technologist. And basically, in that in that area, I did a, a sort of rinse and repeat. I was bringing together this idea that you know you're going to take the most or second most expensive device you will ever own or or buy in your life, the car. First one being a house. Take a car and then connect it with the most personal device you'll ever know. And so what was born from there was this idea of connecting and bringing content into the car and enabling you to be able to break that Henry Ford ethos model, which is you can have any color you want so long as it's black. You can have any feature you wanted. We were going to bring it to you and make it available. Um, started talking to um, Al Mulally and the team and said, you know, this is what we're going to do. And they, while they didn't know what I was speaking of directly, they had actually agreed in my contract hiring to support anything that I, they thought might be crazy. And so I started to travel the world and to talk to other automakers and say, this is what the auto industry has to do. Um, while Ford Motor Company at the time was making 4 million units, at the time, Samsung was making 800 million units. So the auto industry has to come together as a single voice. Uh, for my troubles and for my travels, I became a concierge key member. I you know, became an ambassador at Marriott. I almost got divorced. And I basically learned how to say F you in 13 different languages because no company would believe that Ford Motor Company could be so magnanimous as to just give this away to uh, work in the open to try and connect devices to cars. But two companies did listen. Two companies deeply listened. Uh, and those two companies listened and actually made, made real product from it. And so today, if you look, uh, Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, if you go and pull up their SDKs, actually, in the Android Auto side, you'll see Ford Motor Company, my name, a few of our team in the voice processing. Uh, we basically brought voice into a car through a phone, and that's now in the in the SDK. So again, those two companies made it real, and it's at scale, and it's fantastic, and it works, and it's interesting. After about three or four years at Ford, beginning to realize I wasn't, we were, we were chafing. Um, I left, and I started doing more consulting and more independent work. This is where I started doing things and speaking, speaking about the future, trying to figure out, trying to talk to, you know, entities organizations about the role of technology as you evolve your thinking and as you evolve how you deliver services and in thinking about yourself as a service delivery organization. Um, I've written a book, I've spoken on a TED stage, and of late, I've been noticed, you know, known now for some of the work I'm doing, bringing all of these into the city arena, being able to have cities start thinking of their public space as a product and start thinking about how they might interact then with those who bring product, namely, you know, whether it's autonomous vehicles, you know, scooters, drones, whatever, how cities might be able to think a little bit more deeply as a technology-focused entry and, and how to work through that. So we'll touch a little bit on that as we get into it. But that's who I am, and I do it again to tell you my biases so that you understand the world that I'm coming from as I speak about certain things. But no, no, no talk would be, you know, would be right without a, a couple different caveats. Um, first off, you know, good friend Andy Grove, right? His quote, only the paranoid survive. Um, my goal when you leave here um, is, you know, you're going to have that, you know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, that gut wrenching, oh my gosh, feeling. Um, and there's two different ways for you to interpret that. One is fear, abject fear. And um, that, I would encourage you is not the right the right feeling. Fear will freeze you, it will keep you frozen in place. But paranoia, on the other hand, will motivate you. It will it will tell you something's not right. It will make you feel uncomfortable, but it will not freeze you in location. And so you'll be able to actually do something about it. So my goal for you as you walk out of here is to be paranoid, to have paranoia. Now you're from the IT arena, so by definition, you are all well built for paranoia. This paranoia is gonna be slightly different. This is gonna be more on the social scale, on the technical scale, as opposed to necessarily on the IT scale. And then last but not least, as a futurist, you, you, you really got to get the get, you know, go, the get out of jail free card. Um, and that, that here comes from Yogi. Uh, it's tough to make these predictions, especially about the future. So I'm going to share with you again, um, tre excuse me, trends. I'm going to share with you ideas. I'm going to, I'm going to take things and extrapolate them to the most extreme, almost to the absurd extreme, just to get us provoked into thinking and being able to then realize what's going on. The goal of this session when you're done today is intended to be something slightly different than you might normally see in a nickel Jesus type, you know, arena. It's intended to be thought provoking. It's intended to be exciting and fun. It's intended to, 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 to spark conversation. Uh, it's intended to spark questions and it's an intended to, to, to actually be a learning opportunity. And so this is not IT. There'll be reams and areas in here where I'll touch on software and others, but this is not IT. So I welcome you to sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. And with that, we're going to take you back in time to 1886 when the very first gasoline-powered automobile was patented 
by Carl Benz. This, this was the very first time that we were to put to paper that which we now call the combustion engine vehicle. And in fact, if you were to fast forward almost 150, 150, 140 something years since that period in time, the car today is very, very similar to the car of yesteryear. They are very, very similar. Not much has changed. A lot has changed, but in terms of the fundamentals of what is a combustion engine gasoline powered automobile, nothing has changed. It's very, very similar in terms of its patent coverages. But introducing a car is only one thing. What really needed to happen was the mass production of cars. And for that, we have to thank Henry Ford. And what we see here is the creation of the middle class. We see the beginnings of movement that is personalized. Up until this point in time, your choices for moving were to walk, ride a horse personally, or and then get into some other form of, it would be like a jitney or a, a covered wagon. That was for many people. But Henry Ford had a different view. He was, he was going to take it and he was going to bring it forward. And in fact, his view of the world was embodied in this 1922 article, or um, excuse me, advert in the uh, New York Post, which was opening the highways to all mankind. The view was build a product, price it so that mass people can buy it. And in so doing this, open the world, open the world to all. And oh my, how he has done that. This is an aerial view of Dallas. This is an aerial view of Chicago. And this is an aerial view outside of Detroit, Michigan. For those of you who are numbers oriented, right? If we uh, were to contemplate the fullness of all roads, paved and unpaved in the United States of America, you might be shocked to know that it's only about 4.1 million miles of roadway. I say, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. But for all of who we are, that doesn't seem like a whole lot. And sure enough, it's not. When cars aren't on these roads or when they're not being used, they, they, they have to be here. But unfortunately, we often see them here. And now if we were live, I'd, I'd do a call out to you. And I'd say, does anyone here know how many car spaces there are in the United States of America? And you'd throw out numbers and I'd be you know, laughing with you. And let me just explain to you right now that there's not a number you're gonna guess because in the history that I've, I've, I've ever talked about this particular space or this piece, uh, most people can't even begin to fathom it. But there are just a little under 2 billion parking spaces that are available today in the United States of America. Now, 2 billion spaces, you know, that's a big number. You're, you're technical, so you're like, okay, you can, you can contemplate 2 billion, but when you start thinking about a parking space, which is roughly nine feet wide by about 20 feet long, you start thinking about the actual dedicated space, you can quickly lose sight of what that looks like. So let me just ground you a little bit. It's just around 11,000, 11 and a half thousand square miles. So just under 12,000 square miles of space land that we have dedicated for parking. Now, about 12,000 square miles, that's a lot. Might not, you know, I, I sometimes struggle to figure out what does exactly 12,000 square miles look like. So I'm, I'm from the great city of Chicago. And so 12,000 square miles is approximately 50 times the size of the city of Chicago in its entirety, 50 times. That's how much space we have for parking. This world that I just described to you, this world that I just laid out for you, this world that is very familiar to you, in the, in the parlance of speaking, we talk about that as transportation 1.0. It is individually owned, individually managed, and combustion engine type vehicles. That is the world kind of writ large in transportation 1.0. But there is a transportation 2.0. And transportation 2.0 is defined as shared ownership. It's defined as autonomously moved, and it's defined as electrically powered. So what we're going to do for the rest of this presentation is frame some of the advancements that are happening, what's coming, what to expect, and sort of some of the challenges that you, know, you all might see as you both live in North Carolina, as you start delivering services through the lens of government. So uh, the first one is this idea of disappearing individual ownership. In a, in a recent study, they're done pretty much every year. They can be done by the World Health Organization, USDOT, et cetera. This one's done by DOT. Um, this is the idea of doing a car trip distance distribution. So looking at all cars and as they take their trips and then sort of distributing what the distance is over, over um, uh, a graph. And what you'll see here is that in about 66% of all car trips, so 66% of all car trips are less than seven miles. And anytime you get to a car, they're less than seven miles. So we have a vehicle that we're using that is A, 
only used about three and a half to four percent of the time. And when it's used, it's used for trips on an order of about two thirds of the time for trips that are less than seven miles. So keep that in mind as we're going to start talking about a few different things. The New York Times in 2016 has introduced the idea of that new cars are too expensive for people to own, and they continue to update the study. I leave this here because it's the first time that they wrote about it. But since 2016, people have been aware that the idea of having to pay for a vehicle is getting to be way more expensive than what the average family can actually afford. And in fact, what's happening is the true cost of ownership is being looked at. It's not just the cost of the purchase of the vehicle. You have all these other aspects. As adults, I have two kids who just recently got their license and we're talking about, you know, what does it mean? Like, you know, okay, there's a the car price, but then there's the gas and there's insurance. We start thinking about all the different things that you have to do in terms of the cost of ownership. And so the AAA is a, is a reliable and good form of study. They, they produce every year sort of the, the road, real cost of what they call vehicle ownership. And in this last study, it's around $9,000 a year. That's $9,000 a year to own and operate a vehicle to go less than seven miles on your average trip. Now, most of us in the U.S., we're, uh, we're a two-car family. If you look at the full distribution of, of housing and whatnot, uh, it's a lot of two-car and three-car ownership. So you're beginning to look at you know, real serious $9,000 per car times two cars, $18,000 to $27,000. So there's a real impact financially to ownership. And so keeping that in mind, you're going to see how the framing is. There's a lot of business analysis now behind trying to move in terms of autonomy. If you begin to look at delivery of cost per mile, a recent study from the Insurance Institute of America is trying to break out the cost per mile of what it would take. And there's a number of other articles. And you'll see them in the information cited from Tony Sieb and others about how we can, how do we, how can we reduce this? And what we can find out is, in order for the to, for the average American to travel to what they need, uh, we can we can look at a cost of about just a little under four thousand dollars, four thousand dollars versus the ninety five hundred dollars. And so, from a business perspective, the question is, how do we get there? Is it, you know, how do, we, how, do we, how do we improve transit? How do we improve options? How do we improve distances? How do we improve housing? How can we, if there's this money here, how can we do it? And what you'll see in most of the literature is autonomy has the lens. We're going to take a little bit about individual ownership. But moving forward is, you know, people will always say to me, hey, John, I'm an adult and I don't like to share. And what it turns out is actually we do a lot of sharing. We in the U.S. do a lot of different sharing. We're very comfortable with sharing. In fact, we share an exceptional amount. And obviously, as we start talking about the COVID pandemic, we're sharing even more. But for the mark for us to be able to look at, what we want to really look at when we look at sharing is we want to go look at China. Uh, China is going to be a dominant force in all things transportation, especially in the automotive sector. When you build for markets, you build for the largest market, and China is by far now the largest market. The U.S. was for years. It is now China. So I want to leave just some key stats with you as we're walking through what this might look like. Number one is there are over 150 million licensed drivers in China that do not own a car. They're licensed to drive, but they do not own a car. Number two is there are well, well over, right? Sharing is exceptionally comfortable. People have no issue with sharing, sharing in terms of sharing, driving, sharing ownership, sharing in terms of a ride. And last but not least is car sharing itself is becoming bigger. There is not the possibility of imagining 1.3 billion people each having a car. So government is focused deeply on what do and how do we handle this. Car sharing is a component of a delivery of movement, but it is not the only component. Locally here, when we look at the states, right, we can look at these as a form of sharing. And what was super interesting, right, is LA had in their year about 12,000, 12 million, excuse me, trips on these, right? So the idea of sharing, people are comfortable if presented and delivered this opportunity. And so governments are beginning to reframe and relook at what does it mean to deliver movement? How do I do it? What do I need to be worried about? So as a government agency or as a set of government folks, what you're customers or your counterparts are looking at is this lens saying, okay, with all of this in front of me, what do I need to do? Next up, the next uh, sort of thing to, to look at is the autonomous vehicle. And I remember you, know, you might be getting excited about autonomous vehicle. What, what does it look like? What's there? Um, but let's start talking about the very first road death. Let's, I want to frame autonomy through a lens of not just the economics, but through a lens of safety. Uh, and the lens of safety starts uh, in August 31 of 1869, first recorded um, uh, road death. Uh, Mary Ward, a mother of three, a wife, a scientist, uh, was thrown from a steam-powered car in Ireland on August 31st and died from her injuries. Um, for those of you who are looking at dates, uh, 
1869 is earlier than the 1886 Carl Benz patent. Uh, back then, there was a big debate which was going to win. Was it steam or was it combustion engine? And ultimately, we know that combustion engine won. But in 1860s, there, was, there were cars that were being propelled by steam plants, basically. Uh, coming closer to home in September of 1899, Henry Bliss uh, stepped off a, a bus, a, a bus that was or a tram car in New York City, stepped off it and was pinned and hit by an electric car uh, that was making a turn and pinned him. And he died from his injuries two days later. And so from the beginning, this form of transportation, this idea of giving the individual um, a control point, giving them this, um, has been accompanied by the tragedy of what is sort of road collisions generally, and then unfortunately road deaths. And so when we begin to look at the lens of, of that, not to put a downer on your, your, your first session for today, but uh, on the order of about 1.25 to 1.3 million people die each and every year on the roads throughout the world. Um, this is accompanied by about five and a half to six million people who don't die, but then are left forever, ever maimed and changed. In the, in the U.S., local to us, at the year end 2022, or sorry, 2020, uh, we had 42,060 people lost their lives in road traffic, road-related traffic incidences. So 42,060 is basically equivalent to two fully loaded, just a little over two fully loaded 747s falling out of the sky every week, each and every week for 52 weeks in a year. Um, we know that that would not be, would not, would not be acceptable. We would not, we would change if that was in fact the state of affairs in the aviation industry. And so the land side of the, of the US DOT, as we look at what's going on, there's a whole re, re reckoning of like, how do we build better systems? How do we manage systems that are more safe or as safe as they possibly can be? And in so doing that, deliver the services that we are trying to deliver against the economics that we want. And what this has led to is a good friend of mine, Gabe Klein in 2016 coined the phrase, human driving is the new smoking, trying to play off of the early nineties where that phrase was smoking, right? It was, it was, it was a groundswell. Uh, government responded because of the groundswell. And so again, the same thing, bringing and drawing awareness to what's happening is beginning to create focused views on like, so how do we use technology? How do we use new designs of streets? How do we do, how do we bring all of it together to try and accomplish that which we want to do, which is to deliver movement to our citizenry in a safe and efficient manner. Now, one of the things that people will say to me is like, I'm never getting in a car that drives itself. And um, I, I, I can appreciate that, but I want to just bring to your attention this, this picture. This is taken from the inside of the vehicle, looking out as we're driving at night. And, you know, some of you will be looking at it and you're like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, I see it's a nighttime road and whatnot. But I would draw your attention to that you, you on the call here, you trust someone you've never known. In this picture, you trust them to do all of these things, know all the rules, be, not be on a call or distracted, not be distracted by the radio, not be on opiates take the right meds, not be drunk, not be tired, not be texting. I mean, you have a lot of trust in humanity that they're going to do the right thing when presented with that picture. And we all know that we don't actually do all of these things all of the time. And so one of the real strong things that we're beginning to contemplate and have to understand is there is a world and space for automation. It will happen. And the real question is when and by, by whom and what role does government play? What role do you then as technologists within government play? No presentation about this world of autonomy would be complete without this, uh, this era, aspect here. Um, if we're looking here in uh, March 18th of 2018, uh, a tragedy unfolded on our streets. Uh, first autonomous vehicle co uh, collision with a, with a pedestrian. Um, the, the woman, Elaine Herzberg, died on the scene with the injuries suffered. Um, so it is not that automation in and of itself solves all these issues, but there is a journey that we have to take and understand. And so deep lessons have to be understood that technology by itself is not the solution to all the quotas that we have. Excuse me. <clears throat> the next area and dimension to kind of look at, which is exciting, is the electric vehicle. And, and the electric vehicle, just as a, as a, as a lens for, for, for you all and understanding what's happening and what we're doing and where we're at, um, GM did a, a study 
And they went and they looked at all the sticker prices uh, from 2008 to 2015, and they went and looked at the mile per gallon, which is an EPA requirement. And Ken and noted them and did the analysis. And what they were able to do is they were able to say is the you know the actual change between 2008 and 2015 for seven years of dedicated focus was equivalent to about a little over a half a mile a gallon per year. So basically, a, just a little over an improvement of a half a mile a gallon per year. Now, in the U.S., we have some standards against what we're trying to you know, accomplish in terms of the efficiency of use of gasoline. And, and what we have in terms of 2025, notwithstanding where we get to in terms of our politics, it's still in place today. But we're looking to have a, a, what's called a corporate average fuel efficiency of about 54.5 miles per gallon, which is the CAFE standard. What that equivalent really means, it's about 44 gallons, 44 miles actual. In order for us to move that distance, we're doing just a little around two miles per gallon, which is way faster than what we have previously done. And the reason for doing this and the reason for pointing this out to you is what's happening in the world of automotive engineering is we're, we're done. We're done with all the low-hanging fruit. We're done with all the, 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 the really easy and simple things that we can grab and hold on to. What we're really left with exotic, aka really freaking expensive. Um, and so what's happening is there's a lot of reckoning going on in all of the auto industries about how they can accomplish this. Well, as it turns out, there is a way to accomplish it, and that is to don't produce any emissions, which is electric. Now, what's super interesting is this is a breakdown of a, a, a later year combustion engine vehicle. It's just shy of about 2,500 parts that make up this combustion engine vehicle. Uh, for those of you that may or may not be fully aware of the Tesla story, that is the Tesla sled. Uh, the Tesla vehicle, when you take it all apart and break it down, only has a couple hundred parts to it. And so people in the automotive industry are beginning to realize that the EV arena going to electric is a way to address the uh, necessary uh, emissions control, but it's also a way to address simplicity. It's also a way to reduce the design complexity that comes from a combustion engine vehicle. By reducing design complexity, we increase ability to repair, we increase speed at which we're able to deliver, but we also reduce the amount of time in terms of warranty. So there's a bunch of number of wins economically that fit in this realm. And as we go through this, as we look at this, we already start to see that we can start looking at economics. And, and right now, a um, number of different Bloomberg, uh, most notably, is now starting to you know, make the, that we'll call it the claim that we are now at a point where combustion engine passenger vehicles, we, we've peaked. We're, 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 we're not going to sell any more than what we did in the peak. At that peak, it was about 17.8 million units. Um, we're not going to we're not going to see that ever again. We're we're going to be on a decline, and what we're going to be on a decline for is either a decline against all purchases, or and replace purchases with with electric vehicle. And what's so interesting and what was so fascinating is thanks to people like you, people like you, uh, electric cars are going to win on price. Why do I see people like you? It's because you use devices like this. You use devices like these. Um, every time you have a laptop or whatnot, it's the same battery technology. So every investment that's being made by companies like Samsung or IBM uh, in trying to drive battery um, under, understanding for our devices also gets to be brought over to the automotive industry. So we have an accelerant. And so what's going to happen is over time, as you start looking at it, the, the, the propulsion type driving vehicles is going to change. And what that's going to do in terms of price is ultimately drive the EV car price to a point where it will be far cheaper than it will be to ever even contemplate buying uh, a combustion engine vehicle. And what does that look like and why does that matter? It comes from this. Again, it comes from the battery split that's happening, which is really cool. But these battery splits have software. In them. We're going to look at that in a little bit about what some of the, what some of the issues might be when you have software running on a power source. And then last but not least, we can start looking at sort of where, we, where we're going to see sales. And we're, we're going to see sales in roughly five major areas. We're seeing them in China and Japan, but we're going to see them in the U.S. Uh, we're going to see them in, in, in parts of Europe and India. And so these big markets are all moving. They're all dealing with massive climate issues. They're all dealing with massive, massive sort of structural issues in terms of energy. And so we're seeing that reflected in the policies. We're seeing that reflected in sort of the behind behaviors. And we're seeing that sort of reflected in the opportunity in terms of product. If none of this is enough to convince you, if, as you're sitting here, you're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, I like my F-150, I like my diesel truck, I, li I, li I like my, I like my, I like my power. Um, I, I'm with you. I, I, I too like my, my, my power. I do like it. But let me share with you a few headlines from around the world over the last couple of years. 
governments from around the world are doubling down on commitments to ban the sale of diesel and petrol, either to cars or trucks, trucks only, cars only. Um, Stanford um, recently doubled down on a, a recent study that they put out in, uh, in 2016-17. They reissued it yet in 2020 uh, about the idea of fossil fuel vehicles you know, ending. And the idea of pulling them off the road over time. Um, one of the big, again, big markets that we were talking about before is China on the global scale. It roughly was you know, responsible for about um, uh, 30 million vehicles uh, in, in years past per year. Uh, it has enacted a ban on, on, on fossil fuel vehicles. So no new vehicle sales by 2030 in terms of fossil fuel, no trucks with diesel on the road by 2035, and no vehicles on the road that are combustion engines of any kind by 2040. So China's standing firm with this. They're on a very big movement to try and get away from this dependency as they have no natural gas or natural oil reserves by which to drive, and they're very dependent on international. Coming more more locally at home, our big market in the U.S. is actually California, um, and California, you know, following in the in the world, has enacted its own you know state ban, not not a country ban, it's a state ban. Uh, they've enacted a combustion engine vehicle ban starting in 2035. They've also started a truck ban in or a diesel truck ban in 2030 that all trucks must be electric. So we're seeing a bunch of movement that's driving the government's doing enough signaling that industry is going to likely follow suit, and this will become its own flywheel. And so in our future of you know future looking in about 10 to 15 years it we is very very much going to be a world that is driven and highly defined by the electric vehicle regardless of how all of this all plays out what most economists are looking at here and what most economists want to look to is something called the passenger economy and so as a trend i think for you all, this is probably the most exciting thing about what's coming into, into, our, into our future. Um, a couple different things define what the passenger economy is. Uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, in the, in the you know, 2017 18 timeframe had issued a report basically claiming that by 2030, there was going to be you know, an incredible, incredible pronouncement of, of autonomous vehicles and your ability to be able to do things. It was, it was, an, ama it was an amazing future, which we're, we're kind of backing off of. But then Tony Siba did something in, in, in the world of writings in 2019 where he issued a report, which was super interesting. Sorry, I apologize. 2016, 17, and then reissued in 2019. And it was all about transportation and the cost and the economics, what was driving it, and some of the numbers that you were seeing earlier. And then you know, another group came out and said, you know, regardless of where this is, I, I, we want to talk about what the impact is. Like, what happens if any of this all comes to, what happens if these three trends, the trend of individual ownership disappearing over time, the trend of, of electrification coming together, the trend of autonomy, what happens if those trends all come together and they all crash and collide so they're not, no longer independent, they're no longer these independent silos? What happens? What happens if and when they converge? So they began to speak, and you'll see in the information cited, a new world, a world defined by about $2 trillion of, of new value, of new economic value added into the world uh, uh, that we have today. $2 trillion divided out into a world of value to the U.S. measured in hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars. And so we're beginning to see, again, this idea of economics driving and beginning to position in place. What's interesting and cool to talk about, though, is that all of this stuff that's happening, all of this opportunity is giving cities and local government uh, a sort of urgency right, to achieve high held goals for single occupancy vehicles. And so you're seeing a whole bunch of communities around the world coming together, big cities, small cities, communities, municipalities, counties coming together and beginning to argue and trying to put their finger on the scale to say, great, we understand the verticals. We like sort of some of the advancements. We want to put our specific lens on it with respect to vision zero, zero deaths, zero collisions, safe walking environments, a reimagined sort of city speak, a reimagined cityscape. And we want to put our finger on it, but we like what we're seeing so long as the lens of safety and the lens of social justice and equity are still maintained. Now, backstopping all this, and we're getting really into the, the more exciting piece for you all is all of this is only possible. Everything, everything that we're talking about is only possible through application of software. And probably the most interesting for our conversation today in that realm, and to try and maybe get you excited, is this idea of Tesla as a company. And so as you begin to look at what they're doing and what they what they have accomplished, they, you know, they, are they a car company? Sure, they're a car company. But you know, if you were to ask them, they'd say they're a software company, they deliver energy and they deliver transportation. 
And so there's a conversation to be had then about what, what, what does that look like? So what does it look like when you are software focused against delivering a product? And what's really interesting is this quote that you see right here, um, right? This, this whole, it's somewhat of a, it's somewhat with disdain, but what they're trying to do is challenge, challenge this idea of the physical world, challenge the world that, you know, there's a way for us to transform. And in that transformation, in that digital transformation, right? Modern technologies at play. And so our government, our regulations, uh, those who service us, those who are called to civic duty, there's going to be a responsibility to understand this role of modern technology as we begin to contemplate regulation, as we begin to contemplate rules, and as we begin to contemplate the, 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 the sort of refactoring of the rules that are currently in place. And last but not least, right, there's a whole bunch of, you know, things that have been written in and around what's going on and what's happening. And it's super interesting and it's super exciting. And yeah, it's like, wow, if this really comes to be, I could, I could really, I could really see it. I, I could really see it happening. Now, something that is so interesting to me as a, as a car, as, as not really a car person, but as a software person who's worked in the car is this, this is what is the ethos of Tesla right here. And I'll let you, I'll let you read it for a second. So when you bought and when you buy the latest car from Tesla with the latest capacity in terms of battery and the chassis and all the structural aspects related to it, um, you can do something like you can begin to unlock um, different modes of power. And one of those is called ludicrous mode. And uh, this is the screen you get when ludicrous mode is when you want to unlock ludicrous mode. Um, there's, I can tell you, having worked for three and a half years in the auto industry, uh, there's not an automaker in the world of any government anywhere who would be able to get this screen past regulators or and past the company at all. Um, and so this is, again, a testament to the sort of thinking that they bring to the marketplace in terms of trying to re-envision and reimagine what's happening in the world of transportation. They've been so successful at doing this, so successful that this is now the case. We're looking at, at the end of 2020, right? Uh, Tesla's in what would they call the 600 billion plus uh, market cap club. They are only fifth to Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. Now, um, in the recent you know, January and February, Tesla actually unseated Facebook uh, and was uh, behind only Apple, saw, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. Uh, since then, there's been a whole bunch of stuff happening and a whole bunch of stuff coming down, and Tesla's back in and around the $600 billion mark. But this compares to like $48, $52 billion for Ford Motor Company, the totality of about you know, $800 billion for all the automakers that exist in the world. And so it's a dramatic play that the market is understanding and rewarding the innovation that comes through a software focused, software lens focused future. And so as we're, as we're contemplating this, and as we sit through and think about this, is there an end of an era here? Is there the end of the auto industry as we know it today? And, and what does that mean for, for everybody in the world and everything that we do in the world? And so this is, a, as this is an analysis that was done in uh, 1617 with you know, you know, you know, answers that came out. And basically the question was, you know, are you prepared for challenges? Are you prepared? You know, this is the auto industry. And this is how the survey results came out. Basically 71% they were said some were prepared and 10% said they weren't prepared at all. On um, the next question was, you know, it was adaptable to facing change. And 33% uh, said they were adaptable, and about 59, 60% said they were somewhat adaptable, and 8% said not adaptable at all. And in the world of corporate America, if you're asked by analysts and journalists what you think of your future as, a, as an industry, as a company, you have a fiduciary responsibility to, 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 be, you know, to be good. You don't, you don't want to lie, but uh, you don't want to give guidance that suggests from Mac that you just don't understand how this future is going to play out. And so given all of that, um, there is a, a belief that the industry that we know, the ability to buy cars individually, the idea of 24 or 25 different automakers, the idea of the, of, the, of the dealership, the idea of the individual vehicle, your ability to rank and your ability to wrench, that, that whole world that we have defined and has been present for about 100 years is likely, is likely going to disappear. And it's likely going to disappear. And it, it disappearance will probably be far quicker. And it, it will bring with it a bunch of radical social change. It will bring with it a bunch of economic change. It will bring with it a bunch of psychological change. And the question that we have to ask ourselves as we contemplate the future is, are we actually ready for that? To bolster this, um, I want to introduce you to uh, an executive 
uh, from General Motors. Uh, he's the only executive who has actually had uh, four. Uh, he's been on all three major companies, all three major auto manufacturers. And in uh, 2019, he had published a, an article basically that he had written certain words like the end of the car industry, people will no longer drive and cars are over. And uh, Bob Lutz is his name. And no one's ever refuted that. So as we contemplate this, as we sit here today, looking out over a horizon of 20 to 30 years, I would invite you to think about what that world might look like if, in fact, some of the things I painted here are, 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 are come to life. Now, if we were together, I would, might be able to see some faces and see some body you know, you know, action, and you'll be like, you know, I, I don't know, man. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't agree with some of this. I don't agree with the rapid change. And so what I'd love to do is just do a little thought exercise for you in transportation. Uh, this is a picture taken on Easter morning in 1900 from Fifth Avenue, New York, New York. Uh, and what I'd love, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but if you, bring your, if you bring your eyes up close enough, uh, there's a lot of horse and carriage, a lot of horse and carriage, but there is a car. There's one car in there. And so I'd um, like to try and figure out if you can where the car is, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it for you here right there. It's where the car is. So again, 1900, Easter morning, Fifth Avenue, New York, New York. One car. Here we are. Easter morning, 1913, 13 years later, same corner. And now I want to ask you to find me the horse. And it's right there. In a city that in the late 1800s was just dealing with trying to understand what to do about the crap, literally the crap on the roads in the streets due to horses. 20 years later, there was not a single horse to be found on the road system in New York City. Now, some of you might look at that and say, that's, that's too far ago. That's, not, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, I, that, that, let's, let's talk a little bit more modern day. We can, okay, great. Um, in the mid 1880s, 1980s, sorry, AT&T hired McKinsey uh, to try and forecast cell phone adoption by the year 2000. So this is 1985. Uh, Motorola just produced the first cell phone. We're you know, beginning the world. We've got an AT&T. We're beginning to you know, look around this arena. And, um, and so McKinsey did what they do, right? They produced a beautiful, heavy, feels like an A report. And they forecasted that their 15-year forecast, 15-year forecast in 1985 was that there'd be a grand total of 900,000 phones in the world. 900,000, grand total. Uh, there was 109 million in in uh in the, the year 2000 they were off by 120 20 times what this is about is exponential change the idea that things happen so quickly that we can't our minds our linear minds cannot forecast them so i would encourage you as you're sitting here taking in and reading this saying maybe maybe not but more importantly what does it mean to me what does it mean to government if this happens what does it mean to government what does it mean to government who delivers services what does it mean to the it team or it technology professionals who are forced or in, you know, on the hook to support government as they try and deliver or respond to these kinds of massive disruptions in our social fabric our technology fabric and our working fabric to so wrap down to a close here, I'd like to just introduce you to a few thoughts to leave you with. Um, you know, Mark Andreessen, uh, a few years ago, said that software is eating everything. And his comment was really all about the world of the, the idea of software as a fundamental building block of all things tech um, is, is, is insipid, insidious. It's coming everywhere. A few short whiles after that, David Kirkpatrick, a journalist, actually wrote that every company is now a software company. And when he used the word company, it was broadly company. This would mean government. Every government is now a software company or every government now is, is going to be. You cannot, you cannot hide from this idea that software is coming. And as professionals trying to integrate that, what does that look like for you? And again, what does it look like delivering government services? But what does it look like trying to respond to the world around you as you begin to place local government at the forefront? of delivering and helping citizenry. I think Erin Rand said it best, Erin Rand, excuse me, Erin Rand said it best when she quoted uh, the idea of we can evade reality, but we cannot evade the consequences of evading reality. And what we're trying to get across here is this may or may not happen, but we see all of the beginning points. We're seeing flares go up. We're seeing the battery prices fall. We're seeing real business cases being made for autonomy. We're seeing autonomy beginning to come in multiple different fronts. We're seeing trucking beginning to take a serious look at that due to driver shortages. We're seeing this in terms of our airspace. We're beginning to realize these individualized threads that are slowly percolating up. 
The real question is, is where does convergence happen and does convergence happen? But regardless of that, wherever that might happen, I think the best way to send you off today as you begin the rest of your session, as you begin to contemplate what you're thinking through and what you're going to be learning, is the great famous purported Chinese curse, which is to may you live in interesting times. Regardless of what happens, life is going to be interesting over the next five to 15 to 25 years. We will not and cannot predict exactly what's going to happen, but we see enough now that we can begin to shape a future world. And if we don't like that, to come back and say, hmm. How do, I, how do I play that? And so with that, I'm going to send you off with this. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Now, I welcome you in your 2021 conference to contemplate the future, the future of tech, the future of government with tech, and how you as both civic-minded participants in this arena can join and can best deliver value both to your colleagues, but to your citizens. With that, I thank you very much. And I'll take questions then from Felina. Thank you so much, John. That was a great, great session. Um, we do have one question for you. Um, the question is asked, as electric cars, the numbers for electric cars are produced, that are being produced are ramped up to the numbers that equal those of combustion engines, where, where are the materials used to make the large ones? Where are the materials? <laughs> I can't yep. understand that. Um, and yeah. how is the environmental impact of these being built disposed of any better than the combustion emissions? Absolutely. Ac excellent question. Um, I'll give you the short answer here and whomever whoever wrote that I would I would welcome you to to bring into um, to bring into the writings. Um, so we have a, a bunch of, of, of reports and whatnot. Um, yes, the, the idea of mining lithium you know, uh, cobalt, some of the different materials that you need um, are dangerous. Right, they are still stripping the earth of, of certain materials. Um, there is a, a an environmental construct that we have to be concerned concerned with. Absolutely, uh, there's also a geopolitical concern that we have to have um, when we begin to look at where um, where the sources of these materials are, and we begin to overlay maps. And so, in the in the in the writings that I'll send you afterwards, there are a couple different articles that will speak to this. The geopolitical one is a super concerning one because uh, it restructures you know everything that we do, both from a militarist you know military perspective. I mean, everything that we've done to date as the U.S. has been driven predominantly through this idea of an oil-based lens and, and sort of how our power is projected in the world. And so that is going to come under increasing scrutiny. Number two, in terms of the actual disposal, right, there is, a, it is, it is an open question. Um, we know that it, uh, there's an open question to try and figure out how we are going to do that, what's going to happen. Those are open questions. I think where if you look at the Paris Climate you know, Accord, if you start looking at what are some of the concern signs, if you start looking at some of what's happening in terms of, in terms of environmental things, a couple of different questions are starting to, to raise awareness. Is like, do we have the time to wait to figure out how you might dispose of some of these, you know, lithium-ion batteries? What would we do to recycle? Do we have the time to wait, or do we instead try and understand that when we start framing this, begin to frame with an idea towards environmental concerns? And so, what you'll see in some of the writings that come from government is a commitment to uh, renewables, right? You'll see it in terms of geothermal. You'll see it in terms of wind. You'll see it in terms of water, and an increasing, you know, terms to solar. So it's, it is not a clear answer. It is a, a good answer, and it is a question that sorry, it is a good question, and it is a question that is at the at the backdrop of framing the policies about how we approach this. Uh, but there's not a clean answer that says this is better or cheaper or easier than this, and therefore we should be doing it. That's not there yet. Okay, great. We have two more quick questions. Um, one person said, "What about motorcycles?" Yeah, what about motorcycles? Uh, I love it. 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 Um, yeah, motorcycles are uh, are part of the uh, they're part of the ban. They're part of the vehicle ban. So combustion engine vehicles would include motorcycles. Um, I don't fully. I don't. You know, I'd have to go back and look. And I will. I do have an article that uh, it's it's in your packet. I'd have to go back and reread it with a, a specific lens to motorcycles. But motorcycles, you can now start seeing. You are starting to see electric motorcycles. Um, the idea of building and delivering electric motorcycles will actually have more power. Um, some of the there's some newer, fancier ones that actually then have gyroscopes or gyro balance so that you can actually balance so that the vehicle always stays balanced and can't tip. Um, so I think you know vehicles, you know motorcycles will ultimately also be hit by this. I just don't know if they're exactly caught up in the exact same legislative you know uh, dates that I gave you as we talk about the conversion in these other markets. 
Okay, Tony, Tony said live wire. <laughs> um, so I have one more question here. Uh, it says, will we be using cryptocurrency to buy all of our EVs? <laughs> Yeah, so it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting. I don't I don't I don't know. I mean, well, is cryptocurrency? I mean, for those of you who are following it, right? We're now beginning to realize that the, the ledgers aren't as uh, aren't as secure as they were previously believed to be. Uh, so, will we see some form of digital currency, i.e., is cash dead? Mm, I don't know. I, I don't think we're going to be buying all of our EVs by Bitcoin. In fact, Tesla actually stepped back from saying they would take Bitcoin for the purposes of their vehicle. So we'll have to see where, where that, uh, where that, 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 that box at to. Um, I'm seeing some of the questions coming across. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So Jennifer, that's a great question. Uh, Jennifer says, are we building an educational system that supports this future? And the answer quite frankly is no. We're not doing enough to teach, I think, the fundamentals behind, I'll, I'll just put generally STEM, but in terms of anything to do with software and an understanding of an, or, or an awareness in a building, right? Um, there is a fundamental to understanding technology. Um, I think what we're seeing, you know, for those of you who watched any of the of the hearings, right? I think there was a, there was a very clear, distinct, stark difference between those in government and those on the technology side answering questions and the kinds of questions that were being asked. So I think this is a, this is a, a noticeable gap uh, educational reform is super is going to be super required for some of the success factors that we're seeing here and reform specifically in like a software construct understanding. And when we say software, by definition, then we mean the ability to do sort of mathematical imagining, right? And thinking the ability to contemplate different, different ideas and hold two different ideas at the same time. So more work is going to be needed there. There is an article actually in the, in the deck I'm going to give you about sort of rethinking the educational system. It's about 150 years old and it's built basically hasn't changed much from the time of trying to get people to be able to understand right basic arithmetic and reading so that they can help with the train schedules. So definitely a, a, a reform needed there. Um, yeah, uh, Darren asked, what about ransomware and hacking of the software in the vehicles? Uh, absolutely, right? Um, this, is, this is absolutely a concern and a key concern. Um, I, I, I do have some articles uh, for you. I have participated in hacking vehicles for the US military. I've been able to demonstrate how you can take over vehicles. Um, it is a real thing. It is absolutely a real thing. Um, it doesn't have to happen in the vehicle itself. It can happen in the supply chain. So going back actually, you know, even to Jennifer and the idea of the education system, right? Looking at supply chains and going all the way back to where we source either silicon or how we're sourcing different parts as they come together, right? There's multiple different places that this can happen. And so we, um, you know, the ability to deliver and to understand what does that look like? But it's not just in the vehicles, Darren. I would draw your attention to the uh, gas line, right? The, 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 the ransom hack last week or a week and a half ago, right? That occurred. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, all sorts of, you know, our power and our power systems, our batteries and our battery packs. Um, for those of you on the IT side, right? You're seeing, you know, stuck neck and the idea of being able to, you know, take PLI programmable logic and, and, and really overrun any safety considerations and, you know, allow for uh, sort of uncontrolled, you know, runaway uh, scenarios. Um, we're looking at, you know, for those of you who are following anything in the arena of social social hacking, right? Deep, deep fakes, right? Those deep fakes generally are reserved for the idea of pictures, or now most recently even videos. Um, but there's new new research coming out about deep fakes surfacing in sort of our geography and the idea that, you know, that which we have previously thought to be unassailable, namely a picture taken from space, looking down on the ground, it's an unassailable picture. It's what's real. It's what's there. And research is now showing that we are, in fact, um, can in fact have a world where we can have a deep fake, where we can actually have a map that's now not Thanks. the same as the world in which it lives. Okay. Uh, I think those are all the questions, yeah. Felina. I don't know. No, I gave it to you. Oh, here we go. Uh, Tony asks, do you think right to repair legislation will unlock the proprietary software that is embraced by manufacturers across the board? That is uh, a super good question. Um, the right to repair is 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 a critical is a critical one. This vote that happened in Massachusetts, right in twenty in twenty twenty, the continual sort of um, revisiting of DMCA and the twelve oh one section of of the of the legislation. Um, with software permeating everything, right? With software coming into everything that's physical, the you know, what does it mean then to have a copy? And so um, I don't know what's going to happen here. Repair isn't just you know there is a there is an idea that is currently being floated around is there are certain things that might be too complex to be repaired, 
or they're too complex to be repaired by the common person and that they do require a level of certification, especially as, as, these, as these things are becoming more safety critical. So for example, if you think of a vehicle, a modern day 2021 vehicle is going to have car, you know, it's going to have sensors, it's going to have cameras, it's going to have all sorts of other things on it that are probably beyond the, the realm of the modern, the modern mechanic. And so, you know, what does that look like in terms of delivering training and certification? And so I think the right to repair, while it may not unlock in the truest sense of the word, I think what it will unlock is a, is a world where, yeah, third parties who are unrelated to the company can do repairs and they can do repairs on this unfettered. They cannot be blocked. What, will, what does it mean though that you can use third party parts? And I think that's an open question really, because again, the parts will have software. And so what does that look like as you start talking about an integrated system? And I think that is an open question. And unfortunately, going back to Jennifer's question earlier, right, we don't have a lot of training and schooling. So, so when we sit there with our politicians or, or with, with, our, with our leaders, and we start to try and talk about that, right? Trying to filter the legitimate concerns and interests related to safety or economics or equity or social justice against the business concerns of profit is going to be more and more difficult. Difficult, but it is ultimately the heart of that conversation. So I'm hopeful that more will happen in that arena. I just don't know if we'll see a complete world of completely unlocked product as, as the question you know, was looking to, to suggest. Um, yes, is there a plan for commercial com uh, combustion engines, trains, ships, and aircraft? Um, there is. Uh, it is not, unfortunately, uh, it is not at the level that we're seeing today in terms of uh, in terms of, of cars or the kinds of production vehicles that we're talking about. Um, what we are seeing, however, is most of uh, most of the innovation. There's a bunch of innovation in batteries. There are a bunch of innovations going in batteries right now. The problem with the battery and a plane is just the weight ratio to power. Um, right? We don't, we don't have enough battery power to, to be able to carry the weight in and then be able to run through. So what we'll see over time is we, I believe we'll see a, uh, a world where, yes, more and more of these, these, these vehicles are. Uh, but in terms of commercial air flight, aka turning off your 747 or your 777 and making it all electric, that that is measured in the you know 20 plus years out. Uh, but it is on the radar and it is on the radar screen uh, because air travel or, and, and, the, and that world of commercial travel is in fact a, a large contributor to the overall sort of combustion that we find in the in the area. Um, okay, let's see, Hunter Smith. Hunter Smith is our intern, <laughs> one of our interns. Yep, 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 yep. This would be a huge change and the money would increase tenfold. Yeah. Yeah, so Hunter, yeah, it isn't the equipment, you know, to to make the batteries uh, to run diesel. So if you're talking about mining equipment, yeah, it is all diesel right now. And so as we, as, and, and and I can appreciate, you're like, I, I, your 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 mind is blown, right, about the, about the ability to do to do electric, but electric is actually more powerful on a on a, a per a, a per unit basis. We can drive more power through electric than we can through combustion. We can still only get about a fifty fifty nearing 50, a little bit over 50%, you know, full burn rate to try and get combustion. So we have just a whole bunch of space left. And so um, we'll see a world, again, that is a picture. The picture is a world of all electric, all things electric. Is it, are you, you're an intern, I don't know what that suggests in age, but, you know, if, 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 if it does, is it 30 years from now? Is it 25 years from now? Is it 40 years from now? I, I don't know. Um, again, the idea more than anything in terms of giving you a date is giving you some trend lines and seeing where things happen. With pricing of cars, electric cars, if they could drop, if I could drop a price of an electric car from the standard price right today is $26,500, $30,000 is roughly what a combustion engine car must sell for in order to sell. But if I can drop that price to $20,000, to $18,000, to $10,000, and I'm doing it just by dropping battery prices, then I suspect that we'll see that flip. Then we start thinking about you know these you know trucks and the flip to trucks and so all all vehicles being electric will, will will accelerate the investment in battery tech will accelerate the investment in sort of power management and will accelerate the investment in infrastructure so i think there's a flywheel effect i just don't know exactly when that might be but again the, the purpose here was to challenge your thinking and to give you something to, to contemplate I don't know if there are any last questions. I know, Felina, we're coming up on the hour. I'm happy to stay. I'm happy to go through other questions, but I, I do also know that, that you all have a full agenda ahead of you. Yes, we do. Um, there are about three or four other questions, but we'll stop there. <laughs>
Um, if you oh, if, if there are three or four, if, 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 if you, yeah, if you want to just send them, send them to me, and um, we'll we'll go ahead and uh, I'll I'll look to answer them um, through email with Selena, okay, and then I'll great, look to follow great. up with uh, with the slides and the information cited. Okay, great, great. Well, I'll send you those three or four that are left. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, so much, John. We appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much, everybody. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so very much to everyone. And uh, you all have the rest of a, a good show. Then. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, everybody, John. Thank we'll, you. we'll see you all Take at care. 3 o'clock. Please visit our business partners. How many do I need to stop recording or will it stop automatically? You'll have to stop it, Felina. Unless okay. you end the meeting, then it, then it stops by itself. Okay, got you. <laughs>